So good morning, everybody. Today is Wednesday, July the 6th, and welcome to this morning's meeting of the Aperio Teaching and Learning Group. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia, and I, along with several others, will be facilitating the call today. So welcome to all of you who were able to be here. Welcome especially to our presenter, Martin Ramsey from the Seath Company, uh, representing LAMP. He's going to be giving a very, very interesting presentation on exactly how LAMP works and how multi-institutional collaboration can work with Sakai. So I'm really interested to hear more about what Martin has to say, and not just because he's from Berea, which is close to where I grew up and close to where I went to college. So very excited about that also. So before we dive in here, uh, let's take just a couple of minutes and get some updates from any project reps who happen to be on the call. I know Neil is here. I know that Wilma is here. And some others may want to give some updates as well. So we'll take just a couple of minutes and get some updates. So feel free to dive in. Okay, well, this is Neil. I'm aware I was on out. I was on vacation last week, and I'm aware probably the community needs an update on the status of Sakai 11. So I need to think that through and, and send that out. We had a good core team meeting. Thank you, Dave. Uh, uh, a good core team meeting yesterday. To me, um, we made, there's a lot of great progress. We hadn't we haven't got the RCO2 out. Um, the main thing we were waiting on, and the main concern I personally have is on. Samago specifically around the um, delivery exceptions. Uh, it seems like every time we test it, uh, we run into something, and uh, we were testing it in conjunction with auto submit. And uh, so I'm not, you know. So what we're hoping to do is focus tomorrow's testing on that. Yeah, Laura put in the original. The original issue was yeah. Sam 14.0 is the original one. There's some related Jira's like Sam 29.14 is the one that's uh, hot right now. And I think, um, you know, I was talking to Matt Jones about it and he was kind of, you know, trying to figure out how much effort will need to be put into getting this done. So that's my biggest concern. It seems like Gradebook NG, from what I'm understanding, is in really good shape. Um, other areas of Sakai, there might be some properties, things we're trying to get updated for default properties, which isn't really a big deal. It's just kind of what uh, out of the box is turned on by default. Um, and a few other issues that are getting in there. And then for production, we will need to um, get some conversion scripts, uh, various types of conversion scripts updated before we actually release. But in terms of like having a production level Sakai, to me, as far as I'm aware, that's the main issue we're kind of wrestling with is that Sam and Go issue. So, um, you know, we'll, well, like I said, I'll invite everybody to participate. I think we're going to focus on that issue tomorrow in testing and QA, the test fest, and then, um, and then we'll see what our options are and whether we want to just push really hard to get it fixed, which um, my initial conversation with Matt, he's thinking that might be a good idea. He's worried we might lose momentum. Um, on the other hand, I really want to get 11. I think we really need to get 11.0 out, right? So uh, I'm not really exactly sure of the trade-offs, but that's something I think we need to first do additional testing so we can assess it and then and then consider our options. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get it fixed for 11.0, but that's my, that's my big concern, really. Uh, um, otherwise, lots of great progress, and we're really, really close to a release, as far as I can tell. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. That sounds great. Um, any other updates before we dive into Martin's presentation? Wilma, I see that you and Terry have been exchanging some comments here in the chat window. Anything else that you want to add about documentation or UX or anything before we move on? Um, yeah, actually, the uh, the documentation for 11, uh, sort of the first uh, dump, <laughs> got uh, merged in... Um, couple weeks ago or actually about a week ago um, we'll probably do another merge of the help so we've been um, doing some last minute name changes for gradebook um, the gradebook ng is going to be renamed gradebook because it's going to be the default uh, gradebook tool so the old gradebook is becoming gradebook classic um, so those kinds of little tweaks um, we were incorporating into the the help documentation so hopefully those will get into um, RC um, 
I heard that there was, it was likely that there would be a, a third release candidate. So we're going to try to get that in so that it can um, be looked at and sort of tested along with um, the rest. And um, I think that's about it for, oh, oh, um, one other update is the, um, the Morpheus um, money that was uh, allocated from the Sakai Virtual Conference, that has been all used up. We just got word from the folks at University of Marthia that, um, that they've allocated all of the hours that we had um, set aside for that. So, um, so they did, I think, over 200 um, fixes, um, over 200 JIRAs that were related to Morpheus that were fixed with the conference funds. So that really um, did a good job at sort of ramping up the, um, the work on Morpheus to get it in good shape for the release. That's about it. That's great. Thanks, Wilma. And I see that Neil has posted in the chat a teaser that he has another announcement that's been building. So go ahead, Neil. Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> uh, there's a, a, a company called Noodle Partners that is working with Pepperdine on some exciting new uh, features for Sakai, and they want to start. Uh, they, they haven't completed them yet. They just started working on them, and they uh, would like to get community input on them and look at a possible contribution. You know, look at their intention is to contribute back to the community. Some of the features, you know, look very different, and so I think that will require some community input. And but pretty exciting. So hold the date for two weeks from today, uh, July twentieth, um, at eleven a.m. Eastern. So immediately following this meeting in two weeks, July twentieth at eleven a.m. Eastern. Right. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Neil. For those of you who were at Open Aperio, I know that Noodle was there and gave some really interesting comments and feedback on a number of different tools, one of which that I saw was forums. So I'm glad that they are interested in joining and contributing to the community. So that's really great. Thanks again, Neil. So I'll wait just one more second in case anybody has any other updates or announcements that they want to add before we move on to our keynote speaker today. Okay, well, going, going, gone. So we are very excited to welcome Martin Ramsey today. Uh, Martin is the head of the Seath Company, uh, which is the company that provides the management and leadership for the LAMP Consortium. Uh, for those of you who are not too familiar with LAMP or may not be as familiar with LAMP, uh, LAMP is a consortium of, I believe, 25 different institutions that all use a single instance uh, of Sakai together. And so that presents uh, some interesting opportunities and also I think some interesting challenges that need to be addressed and overcome. And so we're really excited to have Martin here today to tell us a little bit about that and about how they work with Sakai um, and about uh, what they can do that might be helpful to all of the other schools uh, that regularly participate in this Sakai community. So welcome, Martin. I'll give you presenter privileges here, and then you can take it away. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, now that you've seen my less than pretty face, I'm going to drop that because I think that's probably not what you all do. Um, but uh, thanks for, for letting me be here, and a special thanks to Neil for sort of uh, ooching me towards, you know, you ought to talk about this. So. Yeah, I'm glad to do it. Uh, the LAMP consortium, I think, is, is something kind of special. And, and by the way, at least my preference is that we would have this be sort of a dialogue. So if you have questions, you know, either ask them verbally or uh, type them in the chat box, um, and I'll do my best to, to answer them as we go. And I apologize if there's a wee bit of background noise. I'm not in the usual location that I, I usually am, and so there's, uh, well, I'll try to keep it to a minimum, but uh, it's, it's sort of, it is what it is. So um, as Matt said, uh, the LAMP Consortium is, it's really kind of interesting. It's, it's a unique group of, of organizations. It is a consortium of colleges and universities and some other um, organizations that focus on teaching and learning but aren't necessarily a college or university. But the, the big thing, the, the thing that makes everybody sort of pause and go, wow, is that we share a single instance of Sakai and a whole bunch of other technologies. Of course, we do that because we want to reduce costs. Um, and it allows us to do that by, by having all these uh, organizations in the same instance of Sakai. And frankly, I think what really happens is that together we provide an even better educational experience for our students 
through the use of technology. Um, that's really, I, I think that's probably what I bring to the table, uh, that, that there are so many um, uh, ways to think about working together that uh, it, it would be difficult to, to think about otherwise. So perhaps the thing that we bring to the table is uh, we've kind of figured out how to do this. Um, we have been live since April 28, 2006. It was a day that uh, Terry will remember. She was there. Um, we were in the University of Charleston. We took a picture of the, the group that was there. It was a small little group with the background of the, uh, the West Virginia Capitol building. Um, and we've just grown from there. We've got over 12,000 active users now. And when I say active, I mean truly active. Um, and we are up to 25 participating institutions across. I counted the number of states. We're in 13 states. And as you can see down at the bottom here, uh, we have a, a seminary which uh, it reaches out to Spanish-speaking pastors uh, that's based in Costa Rica. So we're, we can say we're international now, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Um, it's really, if, if I were to describe the community, it's that, that we have this community of faculty and technologists uh, who are governed by consensus. We, we try to make every decision by consensus. We have an advisory committee that sort of uh, leads that. Um, and we have a zero-based budget so that we really try to keep costs as absolutely low as we can. Um, and we've been fairly successful at that. Um, and as Terry has said in the, in the chat there, we have a lot of organizations that I think would not have access to this kind of technology um, if, if it weren't for LAMP. We, we tend to sort of focus on folks who might not be able to afford this otherwise. And, and we, we put them on, give them a world-class experience and world-class technology um, for a, a very low fee. Um, for those of you who are interested in the technology itself, um, it is a single instance of Sakai 10 currently. We were just discussing Sakai 11. Um, our plans are to upgrade in August. It'll sort of depend on when the release candidates are out, and we tend to prefer to wait for the dot .11, dot .1 release, uh, so we're kind of interested in when the 11.1 might be out. Um, our schools don't have a lot of resources, and so uh, it's we, we like to let you big guys uh, sort of shake out some of the issues before uh, we take it on. We do have additional software, Big Blue Button, like we're using right now. We use Verisite. We use Warpwire. Uh, we've got a project with Karuta, the open source portfolio folks. Um, and so forth. Um, it's not uncommon for, for somebody to bring a, a technology to our group and say, would we be interested in, in acquiring this and putting this in as part of the, uh, what, the, what the group offers. And so that, that's, a, that's a common story. Uh, for those of you who are interested in that sort of thing, it's, it's a cluster of five load balanced servers. Uh, they're, they're hosted by Longsight. Um, and we've had a really great experience with uptime, 99.97%, you know, which is world class. One of the things that I used to do uh, back in the day was I would go to a small school and say, so what's your uptime been? And most of the time they didn't measure it, but if they did, you know, it was, didn't come anywhere close to that. And I said, so how'd you like to really be able to offer you know, world-class technology? Um, and that was, that was often kind of a selling point uh, for joining LAMP uh, because we could, we could provide something that uh, small schools had a hard time providing uh, for themselves. To give you an idea of what's included, Sakai, of course, other software, of course, support. Uh, we have a, a hierarchy of support that uh, how we let uh, people sort of request support and so forth. And, and I will say that uh, we rely on you, the, the Sakai community, for um, some of that support because sometimes uh, we, we get an issue that's just so challenging that we need to sort of put it out there to the larger community. Um, we also have a lot of workshops uh, for faculty development and that sort of thing. That's an important part of what we do. We do a monthly web conference, uh, much like this one, except that it's for our members um, and we make a lot of decisions at those web conferences. And uh, uh, we, we do allow our members to do individual branding uh, so that they maintain their own autonomy as well as being a part of something bigger. And we have some interesting technologies, uh, thanks to Longsight, uh, for integrating with local campus systems that are also pretty important. I can, I can talk about that too. So, um, so I, I, what I thought I'd kind of focus on, if this is all right with you folks, is um, so what's, what's really contributed to our success? You know, here we are with our 10th anniversary. And you know what's made it successful. And by the way, since we've got that picture on the screen, I want to I want to just show you that. Let me blow it up a little bit more. This is that picture that was made in the, with the West Virginia Capitol in the background. And there's Terry Golightly right there. Uh, she was there on day one. So, <laughs> right, Terry, you remember? I do remember very vividly. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, and you know it's. That was, that was a picture that was taken a long time ago, and, and yet here we still are, and, and some of the, the same players, like G.K. Pennington, still involved. Um, oh, Marie, uh, what is her last name? I can't, suddenly can't remember. She's at Davis Nelson. She's still involved. 
So, you know, there, there's some people that have been here since day one and have been very, very much a part of this. So I, I thought I'd think about what made us successful. What are our success factors? And this is what I'm hoping I can offer back to you all. Um, you know, what, what have we learned that might also apply to the, um, the Open Aperio uh, community? Because I think that there are a lot of similarities between Open Aperio and LAMP. Um, first of all, I, I think one of the things that's important for us is that our focus is on teaching and learning. It's not on technology. We're not primarily a technology organization. Uh, we always want to focus on the stu students first. Um, and of course, we have a strong belief that technology enables and supports good pedagogy, but pedagogy comes first. Um, I often use this diagram here as, as sort of our support model. And, and you can see it's an upside down pyramid because the most important thing at the top of the pyramid and the largest group is the students that we serve. And then below that, we talk about the faculty who serve the students, but we serve them. We're structured where every campus, every member has a, a local coordinator, sometimes more than one, and they serve the faculty who serve the students. And then there's my organization. Um, we serve the member coordinators. We count on Longsite to back us up, but frankly, we count on you all too. Um, and this is something that I talk to people about when we're, we're talking about open source. You know, they say, well, there's, there's nobody to uh, hold accountable uh, translation, nobody to blame. And I'm like, well, how does that work for you? Um, I like it when it's a larger community of people who actually um, want to support each other. And maybe it's, a, maybe it's a good time to tell a little war story. This actually happened at Kentucky Christian. We were doing a workshop. Um, and uh, I was standing in front of the room, had my cell phone on. I should have turned it off, but it, my, my cell phone rang. And it was Scott Siddell, uh, the president of, of Longsight. And I thought, ooh, that could be important. So I told everybody who it was. And I answered the phone. And, and Scott said, Martin, are you having a problem? And I said, uh, I don't think so. And about that time, in the back of the room, one of the faculty members said, um, hey, uh, I think my browser's locked up. And somebody else said, mine's too. And, mine's too. and you could see it spreading across the room. That there, everybody's browsers were locked up. And I said to Scott, well, maybe we are having a problem. And he said, now, you know, this is going back to release, ooh, probably 2.6 or something like that. It's, it's a ways back. But he said, the Sakai community has identified a scaling problem with one of the databases. And we wondered if, since you were all using it at the same time, um, might it be causing you a problem? Well, indeed it was. He said, but the community has come up with a fix, and if you'll give us about 15 minutes, we'll get installed for you, and you can continue on. So I called a break, and uh, when people came back, the fix was installed, we kept going, no hitch. And so I often tell that story. It's a true story. Uh, Terry, you were there. Dave, I think you were there. Um, well, Dave and, wasn't there, but it was a remarkable day. This was before Johnson was on. Well, that's right, it, it was. was. It was, yeah. yeah. But it was it was a wow moment. And and I've often asked people, how often do you have your commercial vendor call you ahead of time and say, we think you're going to have a problem, and oh, by the way, we have a fix. And then I go on to explain how in the open source community, it's developed by the people who use it. And so they want it to work just as much as anybody else. Um, and so when there's a, when there's a, an issue, then it's it's immediately fixed because people are, are very um, keen to get it fixed for their own institutions as well as for everybody else. So it, it sort of makes the point that open source is actually a, a, a good way to go. So, um, so can we talk a little bit uh, more about that, Martin? This is Laura. Yeah. What do you want um, to know? And, and, and I apologize, Laura. I, there was a tremendous amount of noise a few minutes ago. And yes, it was coming from my, uh, from my background. And there wasn't much I could do about it. Sorry. <laughs> totally, totally understand. Um, so back on the previous slide, you were talking about support. Oh, yes. You mean this one right here? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think so. Focused on support. Uh, back out a little bit over the text on the side. Well, my main question had to do with, um, so not primarily a technology organization, but of course you depend upon Longsight for um, infrastructure that keeps Sakai up and running and uh, updates to Sakai and that sort of thing. Very Does cool. Does Seath also provide like um, support answering? I guess my question is, what what do you mean by support? Could you kind of tell us how the students get support from the faculty who get support from campus coordinators and how that how that works down? Sure. So it, it, you, one way you might think of it is we try to keep things at the highest level on this pyramid as possible. So. Um, a student who has forgotten their password can probably be helped by 
the local campus coordinator. It doesn't need to involve us, but sometimes they do, um, and we, we reset their password. But that's kind of a simple problem. Another one might be a faculty member who says, I've kind of forgotten how this gradebook entry works. And so they'll talk to their local campus coordinator. Um, some are more savvy than others. I've got uh, Terry and Dave are both coordinators there on this call. Uh, they, they are, they're very, very savvy, and so they'll do everything they can to help. And only when they get stumped do they sort of pass it on to, to our organization. And, you know, that, that occasionally happens that uh, we, we need to get something. And then occasionally we find something that stumps us, and so we have to go to Longsite. So these, oh. these issues are getting more and more technical as we go up here. Uh, putting, here here's one way to put it, Laura, and, and I don't know if it's a good way to put it or not, but I see myself as trying to, quote, protect Longsite. Uh, they're a they're a valuable resource, and I don't want to give them anything that we could figure out without having to involve them. So it's not like oh, there's another problem. Let's throw it over the wall of the long side. It's it's like we have we have vetted this, we've researched it, we've done our best to try to figure it out. And there's a there's an issue in the the back of the room database that is actually going to have sure to be sure. Um, and so so, side do that. so when a, a lamp. When someone new comes into the LAMP consortium, they, um, they bring with them someone to be identified as the coordinator. And do you give them an estimate of how much time you think that coordinator will spend? I don't know if Dave and Terry could answer this more fully, but there must be, I know they have, they have different responsibilities, right? Other than being a coordinator. So about how much time does being a coordinator take? I'm, I'm going to let them answer. I'll be curious to hear what they say, but um, but you're right, Laura. When we bring a new coordinator on, first of all, I give them what I call the Spider-Man speech, which is with great authority comes great responsibility. I have um, one of those same speeches. Sure. Right. <laughs> so, um, but be, because um, when, when you're a coordinator, you know, you have some additional powers um, and because you're part of a network, you have to be sensitive to the fact that there are other people in this network in addition to your school. And so that's kind of where the Spider-Man speech comes in. But but I, none of our coordinators are doing it full time, uh, right? By any means. And so I'm curious to hear what what Terry and and uh, Dave would say about what percent of your time do you think you spend actually doing lamp coordination duties? Now I'm not talking about your instructional technology duties. That's something that you would do anyway. But um, you know what 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 does it take to be a coordinator? Terry, what do you think? Well, you have to have a little bit more than the faculty, the regular faculty has more intimacy with Sakai and be able to answer questions and do some troubleshooting. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I'm transitioning right now between Kentucky Christian and Johnson University. So at KCU, I had to individually enter users. So when a new student would come on campus or a new hire was made, I had to put that information in at Johnson. However, they've been able to automate that process, and so that's not an issue here. So that's one variable between the institutions. Um, so it does it does vary depending on how an institution buys into additional technology or uh, relies on the um, manual labor. Um, and it also depends on what kind of resources in Sakai. For instance, at KCU, we've had a syllabus course, which was a repository for syllabi to be stored from all courses that um, at the day after registration I would have to enter all of the students into. So that's, that's another level of involvement. Students might call or uh, call me or come up, talk to me about um, any Sakai accessibility issue they have, um, faculty similarly, or if the faculty said, well, I don't know why my forums aren't showing up to the students, then I would troubleshoot that and educate the faculty on how to structure forums so that it was more viewable to the students, that kind of thing. Also, the administration might say, I'd like you to speak to a faculty meeting about such and such or this and that so that the professional development aspects of them relating to Sakai might fall, might fall on me in a general way or in a specific way or dealing with um, us with an instructor about their individual issues. So it, giving a percentage is kind of hard to do. At uh, KCU, I was putting my contact information on all the courses that I was working with. 
so that I could be contacted for troubleshooting needs by anybody in the course. So I have never really tried to figure out a percentage, but it wasn't a great percentage. The monthly meetings, an hour, um, and then whatever uh, interaction I get from either end of it, because there were communications that I have with Martin on different things as well. So um, it's it's not burdensome. It's just kind of one of those things that you do to make it work, because at LAMP, we've had the opportunity to accept the idea of collaboration and cooperation and making sure that success happens for the people around us. Good. And Dave, what do you think? You want to weigh in? Sure. I would basically say that most of uh, uh, it, it, it is really important to de to be de very discreet about what response because my primary responsibility with the university is as an instructional designer. Um, it was a good fit for me to be able to do this sort of responsibility. But there are definite things that um, are, are 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 the instructional designer part that the university has hired me for, and other the responsibilities that help in that facilitation as a liaison with the LAMP community and insofar as understanding what's coming. Uh, so for example, one of the things that I would do as an instructional designer is I would help folks know this is what's coming in our new uh, version of the LMS. But at the same time, I do spend time in our own LAMP conference calls that happen once a month uh, for an hour. Um, and then, you know, I do facilitate same similar things that, uh, that, that Terry does. Now, here at Johnson, uh, you know, we do have a way to put students in automatically. We update the rosters. So that's not stuff that we have to do here. So that's not an amount of my time that's taken away as an administrative function or something else. Um, but I would say maybe between five to ten percent of my time, with ten percent being, you know, a whole lot of time probably spent maybe at the very beginning when we have lots of new people. But even some of those things are spent um, uh, uh, as an instructional designer, helping people just get yeah. acclimated to stuff. Um, so it's not necessarily coordinator things. Um, uh, you know, things that I might coordinate are so, for example. Uh, when Long Sites recently moved our, our instance of Sakai to the Amazon Web Services, um, that would be something that uh, I, as a coordinator, work with our IT department to make sure everybody's on board about when that's going to happen so we all are aware. Um, uh, but I think that would happen at any university or any other instance where you were doing major changes like that. You'd have someone that would be communicating that information to uh, the rest of the constituents. Yeah, I agree. And and Laura, another thing that's important to know is we have absolutely no bias towards what kind of person needs to be the coordinator. Um, both Terry and, and Dave are kind of in roles of instructional designer types, but we have at Brevard College, for example, we have the chair of the English department as our coordinator. Uh, and huh. I'm trying to think of some other examples, guys. Um, hmm. We have had um, Mary uh, something or other that was like a, a Provost at Lincoln Memorial at one point that yeah. was the coordinator. Yeah, I forget her last name. Yeah, there's, there's just, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting what roles people are in. Uh, in. In some cases, it is the IT people, you know, or the IT person. So they're, they're. Um, I, I don't want to cast aspersions. I mean, their, their bias is not towards pedagogy; it's more towards the technology. But the institution, for whatever reason, sees that well, this is a technical thing, so we better put that technical person on this. Uh, we just require, we LAMP just require that there be a coordinator. Who is that person who's going to be the conduit between um, what what the consortium does and the, the local institution? Um, Although and, interestingly, I think um, is at KCU, the IT people were not involved at all. There's just not a, a compelling need for, I mean, he would say, don't ask me any Sakai questions, I don't know anything, you know, yeah. because uh, it's all in the cloud and it's all through long sight. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's that's right. And Dave's making some important points that I, I also want to make about sort of the, the autonomy. I think that's another success factor. So does that make sense, Laura? Are you good with that? Yes, yes. That um that resolves my thoughts about what does support mean at each institution that belongs to lamp it seems like that's very different and there doesn't seem like the coordinator is doing any um, documentation specific to that institution but maybe they are and maybe the only thing they that's specific is how you log in and how you reset your password and everything else is a community document Laura well, can I um, a little bit of feedback to that yeah. because that's a really good ahead. question because 
Johnson University, we have a 24 by 7 help desk that technically we outsource, but we provide that documentation to that 24 by 7 help desk. And so they are our first line of support for primarily our students, but some, some, some faculty also get a hold of that and, and, and use that. And we have specific and very discreet documentation for them that lets them know uh, if there are things that they are unable to handle um, uh, or are not well documented enough that they can actually address that with a student, then they elevate that to what we call our second tier, which is technically our, our own IT department. Um, and if our own IT department can't actually handle that, then they actually escalate it to me, or in this case, Terry. And if we can't handle it, then we actually escalate it up to what we might call our fourth tier, which would be the wider uh, you know, uh, Sakai yeah. seeds and, 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 and in the wider community. Um, so uh, there, there is some element to that. Now, that's how Johnson University does it. Not every other member in the LAMP community has uh, a, a 24 by 7 help yeah. desk, but they do manage how that sort of support mechanism works. And I think pretty much everybody does that in their way, and it works for however they want it to do. And I think we have that on the, the login page um, as far as where you go mm -hmm. to get the help you need. And, Thank and you. I would also say, I, I, I would also say, Laura, that um, the the maturity of the organization um, makes a difference. You, we're talking here to to Terry and Dave, who represent, or Terry did represent until a few days ago, uh, two organizations that are quite mature with with Lamp. Um, a new organization uh, is probably a little different. There's probably a coordinator who's kind of feeling his or her way, and I'm doing a lot of help and support. Um, they may uh, have their students. Uh, contacting us directly, not something we prefer, but, you know, we'll do it. Um, and, you know, sort of as they mature, uh, things get a little easier and so forth and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it just, uh, it's, it's, it's always interesting. It's always new. It's always, uh, there's always something interesting going on. And, and um, like, I'll just tell you this, right now what I'm working on is, is the new Morpheus capabilities in Sakai 11 present an opportunity to allow member schools to better and more tightly control their own skins for their own course design. You saw the question that Jennifer asked a few minutes ago um, about what schools have control over, and I want to talk about skins, for example. And so it, it occurred to me that I could actually build a website where people could, uh, coordinators could, could put in their specifications for Morpheus, which could then be translated to Longsight, which could then end up in their skin. And so we might be able to, to make that a, a better process in the long run. We're, it's kind of it's kind of clunky right now, but uh, you know you can you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I hope it's not a train. I hope it's actually going to be good. So <laughs> very um, nice. I'm sorry. Say that again. I just said very nice. Oh, okay, good. So um, a few more success factors. The fact that we do share technology, I think, actually is a success factor. A lot of people might see it as kind of a Ooh, that, that causes some complexity, and it does. There's no question about that. But the fact that we have a single instance of Sakai means that we can easily share resources with each other. They're all in Sakai. Um, it means that we can, we can work up shared projects and, and so forth. In fact, one of the things that uh, you've heard the other two mention is the fact that we have this monthly conference call. Well, it's in Sakai, and it's a, it's a site that's been set up for 10 years and has 10 years' worth of minutes to meetings. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, it goes way, way back. So... Um, you know, I think the fact that we share the technology works well. We actually have faculty who adjunct for each other. A faculty from institution A will adjunct for institution B. And, you know, it's like a no-brainer because they already know everything about how it works. It's just like, you know, well, put me in the course and here we go. Um, and it, it facilitates the fact that we can meet together. Um, another thing that, that um, again, might be seen as a negative, particularly to newer members, um, but I think is a, in the long run is a good thing, is that you have to consider the needs of other members. For example, I'll tell you a big debate that we're having right now. Um, when will we install Sakai 11? Uh, not everybody's calendar is the same, and so there are some schools who fear, feel fairly passionately about uh, dates, and they have a different opinion than some other schools. And so my job is to sort of facilitate that and, and make sure that we come up with something that everybody can live with. Uh, and so we have to think about each other's needs, which I think kind of pushes us to collaborate and, and think about each other uh, more than we might. Um, the fact that we have shared governance, uh, I think, is an important success factor. We have these monthly web conferences that we really, uh, people enjoy getting back together. I say that. Uh, Terry and, and Dave may, after I get offline, they may say, oh, no, it's terrible. But I think people actually enjoy being a <laughs> oh, part of Oh, you know that. better. You know yeah, better. I know. We, 
we usually have a good time and so forth. People enjoy getting back together and, you know, how's things going and all that sort of thing. And it's the heart of our shared governance. You know, that's where we make these decisions. We, we run them in big blue button just like this. And then I write up the notes um, afterwards, although every once in a while Terry backs me up when I have to be out. Um, but we, we write up the notes. So, like I said, there's 10 years worth of notes from previous meetings. And you can see how we've evolved and matured as things go by. Um, Martin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go um, ahead. I just made a brief comment, but um, I wanted to elaborate just a bit on shared courses. Uh, there yeah. was a time when we were lacking a teacher, and Johnson had that teacher, so she was teaching the same course here in SEED at Johnson that she was teaching online at KCU. Uh -huh. Exactly. So, um, and, 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 you know, filling up and backing each other's needs. Yeah. I, I've had a dream that, frankly, has been largely unrealized, but that would be that these small schools who have challenges with uh, filling out their schedules might be able to support each other. Um, it's, it's turned out to be more difficult than we think, mostly because of money, you know, who's going to pay for what. Um, but um, still yet, I think it's, a, it's in general, it's a good idea. And as Dave is pointing out, there's room for being different. Um, some institutions use warp wire and pay for it, and others who choose not to uh, don't pay for it. So we have lots of uh, variation. And I apologize, I'm getting a lot of background noise again. Um, wait a minute, sorry, I didn't uh, look at this slide here. Oh, yeah, uh, we, we have this annual uh, summer conference, which, by the way, Laura's going to come to and Neil's going to come to. I'm very excited about that. Chuck Severance is going to come. Um, but we, we focus on pedagogy and how to use Sakai and how to be a part of the community. And this is a decision we made early on. People said, I would like the cost of that to be included in our membership dues rather than having to pay for it specially and have to go to the dean and say, can I go to this conference? And so we include the cost of the, of the, of the summer conference in, uh, in our membership dues so that it, it, it doesn't uh, sort of add a, yet another expense. And I do want to say um, that this is a commercial. <laughs> uh, just, I'll, I'll be quite blunt about it. Uh, this year it's going to be July 26th through 28th, which is coming up in a few weeks. It's going to be in Knoxville, Tennessee. Johnson University is going to be our host. We've got a slew of really good speakers uh, that are coming in. And um, you all be welcome to join us. Anybody who wants to come and, and be a part of it, uh, 350 bucks isn't bad. And that includes we're going to take you out to dinner and, and feed you and as well as house you. Uh, so uh, please plan to come if you, you'd like to. Let me know and so forth. Um, Another success factor, I think, and this has been alluded to before, is that there is individual member autonomy. So each, each school has its own skin, its own branding, uh, its courses look like their courses. Um, they have, we have this interface to individual active directory or LDAP that's been alluded to. Terry said Kentucky Christian didn't have it. Johnson does. Um, it's an individual school's decision whether or not they want to do that. Um, and we also have interfaces to the administrative system. So course creation and enrollment can all be managed. If an institution chooses to do that, they don't all choose to, that's okay. Um, but that's another way that we sort of let each member sort of be autonomous. I think there's probably more that could be said about that. And then let me, I'll sort of wrap up. I realize I'm running out of my time here. Uh, I, we really have appreciated so much the First Sakai and now Open Aperio community that's out there because we, we know that we get many, many benefits from the existence of Sakai and, and the Open Aperio group and so forth. Um, and, and we try to give back in ways that we can. Uh, there are some ways that we can't give back, but uh, we try to give back where we can. There have been a number of our members who have participated in the Sakai 11 QA efforts, uh, so we've been a part of that. Um, Neil, <laughs> Neil has me to blame for the FARM acronym, uh, and, and I really believe that there's some uh, some things that will come out of that that are going to be really good. Two projects that I'm really interested in and our members are really interested in is the Sakai Rubik tool that, uh, yeah, thanks, yeehaw, <laughs> that, uh, that Wilma is uh, pushing. And then the University of Dayton has this new attendance tool. And um, so, we're, you know, I, I, I'm, really, I'm really excited to see ways that, uh, that schools can sort of pool their resources to get new, uh, new capabilities in Sakai built. And I see farm as being a really good way to do that. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, what farm can do. Uh, we've gone to open aperio conferences. Don't get to go a lot, but we've gone some. Uh, we've participated actively in Sakai virtual conferences. Um, but the fact is that we don't have a lot of resources, um, in term, particularly in terms of development resources. You know, if somebody says, could you code this? The answer is probably not. Um, but uh, could we possibly contribute some money toward getting somebody to code it? 
yeah, that's we're. I think we're getting more and more uh, used to that idea. At first, it was a little bit of like, ooh, I don't have that money, but people are realizing that you have to sort of step up. And so um, we're trying to be good citizens of the Aperio world, and we really appreciate its existence and perhaps what some of the things that we do at LAMP um, can be um, useful to the to the Aperio Foundation and the Aperio world. I'll, I'll close with this slide. Um, this is a slide I've used for, for literally for decades. Um, I, it, I noticed that there are sort of four, four C words uh, that describe how organizations could uh, interact with each other. There's the competition. You know, for me to win, you have to lose. And of course, that's real. You know, if, if you get student A uh, in your um, admissions process and I don't get him, you know, I, we can't both get student A. So there is some win-lose about that. But I think an awful lot of institutions are really in the coexistence frame of mind. I don't really care what you do. I'm just worried about myself. Um, then you get to cooperation, uh, which in my mind means uh, an institution says, I'll work with you as long as it su suits me and serves my purposes. But I think at the LAMP Consortium, we actually are true collaboration, which means sometimes I'll even do what's maybe not exactly best for me because it's best for the entire organization. Uh, best for all of us. And so sometimes we subjugate uh, an individual need to the need, the, the good of the group. And I think that's what uh, what makes us really successful. It doesn't always work that way. We sort of sli slide back and forth between cooperation and, and collaboration. But I, my job is to kind of inch us towards collaboration as much as I can. And I think that's what makes it work. So um, <laughs> anybody out there who's interested, we're a really wonderful community. We, we actually like each other. Uh, I think we do good work. You'd be welcome to come to our summer lamp camp, as we call it, um, and you know you could you could actually join us. That's just uh, we'd we'd be happy to have that. Um, and there's some contact information just in case you're interested. So I'll I'll stop and let you ask any questions or and turn it back over to Matt. Um, your call, my friend. I've That's great. Thanks, Martin, so much for this presentation. This has been really really interesting, and I'm sure that. We're going to get some questions from people, and you're welcome to come on the mic and ask your questions, or ask your questions through the chat, and I can relay them to Martin, or Martin can see them himself. I know one question that I have, just to get us started, and you guys have touched on this a little bit, but I wonder if you might touch on it a little bit more. You guys mentioned that you don't necessarily have a lot of resources, and I might say that just a little bit differently, you might have different resources than what some of the larger schools might have, but I wonder if you might say a little bit more, and Dave and Terry can jump in on this as well, about the kinds of things that you think smaller schools can offer to the Aperio community, because I think that the LAMP schools have offered a tremendous amount of different resources to the community in terms of things like QA testing. And, you know, Dave and I have collaborated on some things and he has shared some custom CSS that he has done for lessons with the community. So I wonder if you guys might give some recommendations about how smaller schools or schools that aren't as involved in the larger community right now uh, could jump in. Wow, oh, that's... Uh... <laughs> There's a lot of good questions in there, guys, right? We, we need to think about that. I mean, <laughs> it, you're right. We don't have, we just don't have coders. I mean, if, if you were to say, you know, tell, tell me your best coder, I'd have to think, I'm, I'm probably thinking of a computer science faculty member at uh, Davis and Elkins. Um, and, you know, he's expressed a little bit of interest in, in getting involved in this and perhaps getting some students involved. Um, but that's probably not going to be our strong suit. So I think, Instead, our strong suit is more, you know, how to go about working together, how to support each other, um, and, and that sort of thing. Dave, Terry, what would you add to that? Well, I, I think I would continue with that thought. Um, we're doing something that's, you know, there, I talked to somebody a few months ago that was talking about how this, this set of community colleges was working together. And I said, well, we've been doing this for 10 years. And they said, well, that is different. You were cutting edge at that point. So setting the model for collaborative behavior and getting, um, getting cooperation between schools that have a lot in common but not everything in common, I, it's, it's a, I think one thing that we bring to it is a mindset of mutual success, which right. might be, it's not, it's not a, quantifiable 
resource necessarily, but I think it's a, a valuable attitude that kind of helps the whole community move forward and move forward together. It's a, it's the problem of limited resources really varies with the individual institutions. Um, some institutions can come up with one or two thousand dollars to put in a farm project or something like that, and others just cannot. Yeah. And it's that's just so variable, but hanging together that uh, more constrained institution is at least able to participate and sometimes you just have to carry them along. Yeah, that's that's I think that's well said. Um, there's a couple of questions that are being asked up here. Jennifer asked a question about fees and so I actually have some extra slides in case questions came up. Uh, so Jennifer, let me go ahead and tackle that one. Um, basically what we do is each year we sort of develop a, a budget based on anticipated expenses this is kind of the tricky part that usually happens around April, um, maybe March, April, um, because I have to make some projections about usage rates and so forth among member schools. Um, and for example, this is a very sad thing. Uh, one of our member schools, St. Catherine College, basically announced that it was going to be closing its doors. Um, it just got into too much financial trouble and got a little sideways with the Department of Education. And so uh, as of July 1, they are no longer. And so. Um, did I anticipate that in uh, my budgeting for the coming year? Not really, and so now we've got to kind of make that up, you know, we've got to kind of cover that. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit tricky, but we basically try to keep it as a zero-based budget. The membership has two components. There's a, a $2,000 annual membership fee, and then there's a, a tiered fee based on the number of active users. Um, so it's sort of, it's two pieces, and um, we keep the fees real transparent and equitable. You know, if somebody, I, I, I frequently say this, if somebody wants to change the membership dues model, just so as long as the costs are covered, I don't really care what that model is. But the model we've been using, we've been using for a number of years. I think we worked it out about eight years ago. And so it's, it's pretty, um, it seems to work pretty well and people are pretty, pretty good with it. A, a, a very small school would typically pay about $5,375 a year to belong. Um, and that would give them up to sort of 250 active users, so that's a very small one. Um, a more typical school would say a, a thousand users would be more like $1,400 a year. Uh, but when you compare that, and the next slide, um, I'll have to blow this up a little bit, but I try to do a, a comparison of what's it's going to cost uh, to do similar things with a commercial hosted product or, or even if you self-hosted the open source. And um, I think I, I stand by these numbers. I think they're pretty good. Uh, they continue to be, I, I check them every once in a while. It's not uncommon for me to ask a school. I was out in Wyoming, by the way, and Neil, I saw your question about marketing. Um, I was out in um, Wyoming earlier this, this year and uh, talking to some community, community colleges out there, and they were sort of interested in possibly looking at an alternate LMS, and so I said, well, you know, you need to look at Sakai. The LAMP Consortium would welcome you and so forth, and I, I gently asked them what they were paying currently, and you know they were well in excess of $100,000, and so you know for for something around 14,000, they could basically get the same services. Um, so it you know it, it is a good deal, uh, and and clearly cost savings play a role. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Jennifer, or not, but that's kind of uh, what uh, what I was thinking about that. Uh, Neil, in terms of marketing, how we market, um, I would say we don't market ourselves well. That's on me. That's my fault. Um, but I do try to talk it up everywhere I go. Um, the, uh, the, 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 I, I think one way to think about it is that there are only certain times when a, an institution is really sort of open to the idea of membership. Um, if they've been using Canvas for two years and you know, are still paying those big bills and the people who said we got to go with Canvas are still on campus, it's pretty tough to sort of dislodge Canvas. But on the other hand, if a school says, you know, boy, we're paying way too much for fill in the blank, Blackboard, and boy, I wish we could save some money. Uh, for example, I ran across a, a dean of a school that I had known before, bumped into her in a Panera Bread of all things, and she was complaining about how much they were paying. And I said, well, um, you know, here's how much that would cost if you were a part of the land construction. And she kind of went, ooh, well, now there's a, there's a marketing opportunity. But um, how we get the word out about us, I, I'm not sure that we do a very good job. Um, so I, I recognize the challenge. You know, I think it's the same challenge that the Aperio Foundation has. Um, let's see, what other questions have we got here? Oh, the Morpheus Skin Configurator. Um, I, it's <laughs> Sorry, Laura, it's got an acronym already. I call it CAT, LAMP CAT. C-A-T is the coordinator uh, administrative tool, and it has a lot of pieces to it. Um, 
I've just been realizing that I need to provide a website where coordinators can sort of manage a lot of things. For example, uh, you know, who's registered for the conference from my institution? They don't necessarily know that. Well, they can go in LAMPCAD and see who's, who's registered. Um, they can configure their skins, although we've got some ways to go on that. Um, what else? Oh, they can just, they can just uh, say who their coordinators are and so forth. Um, I anticipate some other things being built into that, too. So, anyway, what else we got? Matt, back to you. <laughs> Any other questions for Martin? We've got just a couple more minutes here. I tell you what, Matt, this, this might be something that people would be interested in. Let me just throw this one in. Uh, this is, this is, and I, I have to give kudos to Longsight on this one. How, how do we manage this authentication uh, when we have multiple schools in the same instance of Sakai? It's, it, uh, this, this goes back, oh, nine years at least. Um, Sam Ottenhoff said, we need some kind of, and this will tell you his age at the time, some kind of gnarly authentication system. And I said, oh, you know, that's an acronym for gas. Uh, so uh, we, we literally talk about schools that have gas and schools that don't. Um, but the, the way it works is uh, <laughs> a user attempts to access Sakai and, and gas basically grabs their, uh, their user ID and says, oh, I recognize that is a gas school or that is not a gas school. And it basically parses that. So if it's a gas school, it then queries the local campus LDAP and says, I've just had a request from you know, Joe Blow to access the system. Do you know Joe Blow? Did he give me the right password? And um, if the answer is yes, then it lets them in. Um, if the answer is no, of course, it doesn't let them in. If they're not a gas school like Kentucky Christian, then it consults the internal user table in Sakai and says, is it valid, and lets them in. So this, you know, gas is a pretty clever little thing that allows each school to basically say whether or not it wants to, uh, alloc to, to connect to its own on-campus LDAP. Uh, Active Directory, and that that works out uh, pretty clever. And I got to give credit to Sam Ottenhoff; he's the one that figured that out. So that you know that that just gives you an example of some of the kinds of challenges that we have to solve that most people don't have to solve because we have a multi-tenancy uh, uh, instance of Sakai. But then that's this kind of thinking, and this kind of, is one thing that Lamp has to offer to the broader community. These new creative solutions. The Vera site was at least partially driven by an attempt to try to deal with the plagiarism detection issues that we came up with. Yeah, that's that's yeah, good point. Yeah, absolutely. I really agree, Terry. I think this is a great example of the flexibility offered through a group like LAMP and also the technological flexibility that Sakai offers. And I think this gets back to some of the things that Neil was asking about and that Martin was just talking about, about marketing opportunities here, that you know, this really demonstrates some of the flexibility of going with a community-based open source solution where you have a lot of different people collaborating together and putting their heads together to solve the actual real world use cases that come up in all kinds of different higher ed institutions. I think this is really, really great. I love it. I, I'd also like to kind of give a shout out to Scott Sidal at Longsight because he's had a lot of, um, of the creative thinking and the flexibility to work with us in this really unique situation. And um, that's, that's really made a lot of this possible. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I have said more than once, um, Scott and I actually met at an EDUCAUSE conference. Um, it was around the time that we knew we had to do something along these lines. We had these small schools that couldn't do anything on their own. Um, and uh, Scott and I sort of hit it off and saw that we sort of had a, a similar approach to pedagogy and technology and, and the, a way to do business. And I would say that Longsight has been a, a trusted partner in this for 10 years. Um, Many is the time that I've gone to Scott or Sam or, or some of the others and said, you know, what would you do? Do you think this is a good idea or that's a good idea? And uh, it's just, it's, it's been a, a really good partnership. Of course, the fact that we were uh, very, very early customers of Longsight uh, probably doesn't hurt either. But uh, they're, they're a good outfit. And I'm, I know it sounds like a commercial, but I really am uh, pretty, uh, pretty sold on, on the, on the Longsight business model. 
And Dave asks in the chat, hypothetically, could other LMS solutions provide the same kind of consortial instance? And I think that's something worth researching because my gut answer is possibly not. And if not, that is another great opportunity for us to show a side of Sakai and a strength of Sakai that other LMSs might not have to offer. So that's a really interesting question, Dave. That's, uh, that's a very good question. I hadn't really thought about it that way either. You know, could you do this with Canvas? Could you do this with Moodle? Um, you know, with Canvas or Blackboard, you, probably the companies would say, oh, you don't want to. We don't want you to. Well, we're different. You know, we, we would be happy if you would. And just another side question here in the chat from Jennifer. She was asking Dave uh, if they had integrated some Office 365 tools in Sakai, and Dave was responding that uh, Office Mix does work because it's got an LTI plugin. And I will, I'll put in a, uh, just a point for our conference this summer. We've got one of our members who's going to be, <laughs> he titled it, um, uh, what was it? Google Apps and Sakai, a match made in heaven or strange bedfellows. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to talk about, you know, how he has integrated Google into his, his part of Sakai. So. Well, we are right at the end of the hour here, and so we should probably go ahead and wrap things up. But thank you guys so much. Thank you so much to Martin and also for Terry and Dave for chiming in and telling us a little bit more about LAMP and how that works. I know that interinstitutional collaboration is really the foundation of what the Aperio and what the Sakai community is all about. And so hearing a little bit more about how this works for some schools who do it on a very day-to-day -day basis is really, really exciting. And I feel even more excited about being a part of this community. And I feel more excited about diving in and doing more collaboration going forward. So. I am definitely excited about stuff, and thank you guys so much for taking the time to get us all fired up. Uh, Terry does um, have a comment here in the chat about our next meeting, uh, which will be July the 20th, and that meeting is scheduled. Uh, we have an LTI roundtable uh, that is scheduled for that day, and... Uh, Janice Smith uh, from Three Canoes, uh, the makers of Karuda, um, and Jacques Renald, Pat Miller from Notre Dame, uh, Jennifer Laudiana from Walsh, and possibly Charles Severance um, are all going to be a part of that roundtable. So that is going to be our next meeting on July the 20th. And then the following meeting, uh, which will be on August the 3rd, is a course development roundtable. And the famous Dave Evelyn, who's been on this call, will be there along with Fawei Zheng from Oxford and Linda Beeth uh, from Roger Williams University. Famous or maybe infamous day. We'll have to decide. We'll think about that. <laughs> so once again, thanks everybody for joining. And this has been a great meeting. And we will see you all right back here in two weeks.